Now we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of anxiety. So anxiety is associated with a number of different structures within the brain that are affected when someone is experiencing something that makes them anxious. One of the biggest structures that we think about is the amygdala. So if you recall, the amygdala is located in the limbic system, and it's responsible for memory processing. This is really where we get the processing of those emotional reactions associated with that flight or fight, flight or fight response. This is regulated by a number of different neurotransmitters, which we're familiar with at this point. So we have norepinephrine, serotonin, and we also have this corticotropin releasing hormone system. You may recall that system through the mechanism of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that we talked about when we went over the emotion section of this course. So same system causing stress hormone to get released and contributing to the experiencing of anxiety. We also have our primary excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So GABA, aminobutyric acid, or GABA, and glutamate. Um, an imbalance in these two neurotransmitters is associated with the development of anxiety type symptoms. So looking more into detail about our neurotransmitters, we have norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is our classical fight or flight neurotransmitter. So when we have an excessive release of neurotransmitter within the brain that is uh, triggered through anxiety, we can see a lot of physiological manifestations of anxiety. So the things we think about when we get anxious or we have to fight something or run away from something. So that can include tachycardia, which is an increased heart rate, increase in BP or blood pressure, tremor, which is shaking of the muscles, and diaphoresis, which is sweating. So all of those unpleasant experiences when we're nervous. We also have serotonin, which is a modulator of a number of different factors associated with anxiety. So this includes norepinephrine, so serotonin can help modulate the release of norepinephrine, as well as corticotropin releasing factor, which is again that stress type uh, response. And this is not related to receptor occupancy, so that is a downstream type effect um, kind of like we talked about with second messengers. Um, and we know this because when we initiate a serotonin-specific drug, say sertraline or Zoloft, we'll actually see patients have the risk of increasing their experience of anxiety initially when we start that agent. Um, so it's not an immediate effect of reducing anxiety, but a long-term effect after we increase serotonin in certain areas of the brain. So looking more into the noradrenergic model, this is the essential theory as to what is experienced when someone who's prone to anxiety is um, getting basically stimulated by norepinephrine. So if an individual experiences fear, then that actually will activate our locus ceruleus and that will stimulate the release of norepinephrine. Once norepinephrine is released, then the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system will be activated and respond to that neurotransmitter release. Following that stress response, we will see the release of corticotropin releasing factor, which will stimulate the release of cortisol, or stress hormone. Release of cortisol is associated closely with the atrophy or the degeneration of the hypothalamus. Um, so then we see a stress response. And over time, the stress response becomes hypersensitive and dysregulated, which can lead to the experiencing of chronic anxiety. If we look at GABA aminobutyric acid and serotonin by itself, instead of its relationship with norepinephrine, this is a little bit more information. So we have GABA, which is our major inhibitory neurotransmitter, which does help to regulate serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine systems together. So when we enhance GABA, or we increase the utilization of GABA within the brain, that causes what we call anxiolysis. And anxiolysis is the relief of anxiety. Serotonin in this context is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that we can find in the raphinuclei. And alterations in serotonin here will actually affect the serotonin uh, reuptake transporter and the postsynaptic receptors. So when we have alterations in those receptors, 5-HT in this capacity will not be working as well as it should and can cause more sensitivity to anxiety. 
If we're looking at medical factors associated with someone experiencing anxiety, some of them really do make sense. So if you think about the physiological experience of anxiety, the shortness of breath, the pounding of the heart, those can sometimes flip-flop and be actually a medical cause that someone is experiencing as anxiety provoking. So if someone has a respiratory illness where they can't breathe well, they're more likely to endorse symptoms of anxiety because let's face it, not being able to breathe kind of stinks. Someone's having cardiovascular issues like arrhythmia, so abnormal heartbeats, we do see uh, an increased risk in individuals experiencing anxiety. So management of those illnesses can be helpful. Endocrine or metabolic disorders, specifically things like um, thyroid issues, as well as neurologic disorders. So patients that experience seizure disorders, for example, or traumatic brain injury will have um, a predisposition to experiencing anxiety. We also have a number of drugs that can cause individuals to experience anxiety. Like I said earlier, antidepressants, although used to manage anxiety in the long term, can acutely or in the short term increase the experience of anxiety due to that increase in serotonin. We can also see anxiety occur with the use of certain anticonvulsants or epilepsy drugs, antihypertensives, corticosteroids, so like a, a prednisone packs. If you have a respiratory illness or an allergic reaction, you might get a steroid and it can make you feel kind of anxious and on edge. Thyroid hormone and stimulants and sympathomimetics. Um, and those things are like Sudafed, uh, methamphetamine, caffeine, all of those things can make you feel uppity, jittery, and it can look like anxiety. So question one, based on our diagnosis and pathophysiology is listed here. Mark has been experiencing what he calls a sense of panic for eight months. He's complaining of feeling worried about every little thing, especially losing his job, as well as making sure that his girlfriend likes him. He reports irritability, difficulty sleeping, and being distracted by worrisome thoughts. He's been less productive at work and it, it's made him feel even more panicky. Now, Mark is otherwise a healthy 19-year-old. So I want you to think about the most appropriate diagnosis for Mark and uh, let me know and we'll answer those questions in class.